Welcome to McCormick Theological Seminary, where we invite you to trust the journey. A vibrant community located in Chicago, McCormick is where God calls you to grow and lead beyond traditional limits through academic rigor, theological reflection, and liberating experiences. At McCormick, we offer the following master's and doctoral programs. Our master's level programs offer students opportunities to be transformed as leaders in the church and society through academic pursuits, critical reflection, and faithful witness. The master's programs that we offer include the Master of Divinity, the Master of Arts and Ministry for both English and Spanish speakers, and the Master of Theological Studies. The D-Men program in McCormick is culturally attentive, context-based, and values group learning. Students matriculate through the program in specialized cohorts, including pastoral care, prophetic leadership, the Korean American cohort, and the Apostolic Assembly cohort. We also offer collaborative D-Men cohorts that include the Ecumenical D-Men and the Acts D-Men in Preaching. McCormick is also home to world-class faculty. Take a moment, listen to Professor and Dean of Faculty Dr. Steve Davidson. I'm Steve Davidson. I'm professor of Hebrew Bible Old Testament and I'm also the Dean of the faculty. I came to McCormick at a critical time in my own life and professional development, but it was also an important time in the development of the institution. And I came and I saw an institution that was flexible, adaptable, always asking the question, what does it mean to be around at this time? What does it mean to be involved in theological education at this time? And I, I fit into an academic program that was asking that question and moving us in those directions. This school has continued to equip people to be the best that they can be wherever it is they feel challenged to work. And so we give students the kind of insights, skills, capacities, and the wherewithal so that they can serve the best way they know. This challenges me as a teacher because it means that I have to craft classes and class sessions to help students answer the strong questions, how to take theological traditions and theological resources that are as old as our thinking and make them adaptable and useful in a contemporary world. That's an exciting task for me as a teacher and I try to make it an exciting task in the classroom. Not only does our faculty pour into our student body, they also lead and support various initiatives at McCormick, including the Solidarity Building Initiative that provides liberative carceral education at Cook County Jail, the Trauma Healing Initiative that equips clergy and faculty with the capacity to respond to the communal and systematic nature of trauma, the Center for Reparatory Justice, Transformation, and Remediation that works to promote an advanced consciousness of repertory justice and engendered communities of practice for people of African descent within local, national, and global communities. Learn more about these initiatives and other faculty-driven initiatives by visiting mccormick.edu or scanning the QR code in the corner. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about our beloved, vibrant community. Wondering if this is the right time for you? Listen to students who believe now is their time. My time here has been an incredible gift professionally and vocationally. My McCormick journey has moved me from being a person who was locked into one way of understanding scripture into being a person with a more expansive view. We could tell the passion and the excitement that the students and the faculty and professors felt about seminary, and it was igniting and engaging.
welcome to Building Beloved, an ongoing conversation with practitioners in the Chicago metro area. I am Joanne Lindstrom. I'm the co-director of the Field Studies and Experiential Education Program here at McCormick, along with my colleague, Reverend Julian DeChazier. Today, I would like to introduce you to our panelists um, who are going to talk to us about their way of building beloved. Reverend Dr. Michael C. Neighbors is the senior pastor at the historic Second Baptist Church in Evanston, Illinois, that is a leading faith center in America in facilitating race talk, solidarity circles in local communities. He also teaches homiletics and qualitative research and theological writing at Garrett Evangelical Seminary um, in Evanston as well. He's been both a Samuel DeWitt Proctor and a Benjamin E. Mays Fellow, as well as a fellow with the Lilly Endowment Program. Since 2019, Dr. Neighbors has been part of the steering committee for Evanston Reparations, the first municipal reparations program in the United States. And he is currently in his third term as president of the Evanston North Shore branch of the NAACP. The Reverend Dr. Michael Wolf holds a doctor of theology degree from Harvard Divinity School. He is the pastor of Lake Street Church in Evanston, Illinois. He is an ordained American Baptist pastor along with Alliance of Bastards, whose career has focused on social justice and interfaith dialogue. He also teaches currently American Baptist theology, policy, polity, and history for American Baptist churches of Metro Chicago, and has served on subcommittees addressing racial justice and white supremacy in both the Alliance of Baptists and American Baptist churches. We are delighted to have both of you here and we turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lindstrom and uh, Dr. DeShazier. It's uh, a pleasure to meet you both. And it is an honor and a privilege for us to be invited to this moment and to share with the McCormick family as well. Um, Dr. Wolf and I was just sharing before we came on, uh, we were together just last night. Uh, we held a collaborative Ash Wednesday service between our two congregations. It was done on live stream, but we did have folks um, who were in the sanctuary of Second Baptist from Lake Street as well as Second Baptist. So we are together one more time this morning and we're grateful. And our assignment and duty is to talk a little bit about building beloved community in the Evanston area. So I will start out and talk a little bit about um, the Evanston piece and uh, uh, what that means in terms of building beloved community. And then I think what Dr. Wolf will do is segue into what we've been doing with regard to interfaith as well. So I've been in Evanston for just about seven years now and arrived to begin the work at Second Baptist in 2015. Um, it was a, a critical and important year for a lot of reasons, but especially for race relations. For you all remember that it was in the summer of 2015 when Dylan Roof opened fire at Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston and killed nine people, including the pastor of that church. Um, being brand new to the community of Evanston, I didn't know how things worked. I didn't know whether or not there was a way for folks to assemble and gather. So I sort of took the privilege of being um, a neophyte and calling the community to rally together uh, behind that issue. It, it's always good, you know, when you go to a place, there's a, there's a honeymoon period that you have and people sort of uh, give you a lot of leeway because they sort of figure you don't know what you're doing or, or, or how to get it done. So we were able to get um, our community to gather together around what we called a community lament. And uh, we had probably about five or 600 people that came to our tiny sanctuary that seats just a little over 300. And uh, it was an interfaith and ecumenical gathering of clergy where we invited um, clergy members to talk and to give their response to, to what happened to condemn the violence, but also to call for for unity and to find ways where we might be able to gather together. We began using the term um, building beloved community specifically for Evanston um, at that time. And again, it was a real advantage being, um, being brand new to the area. 
Uh, so it wasn't, it, it didn't take long after that um, for us to begin to understand the importance of community laments around national tragedies. It was only a year later when there was a shooting in Orlando, Florida at a Club Pulse, which killed 52 people. And uh, that was uh, also an assault upon our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community. So we decided that we would have another community lament. We reached out to the same folks, probably spread the net a little bit wider and um, everybody responded affirmatively. And we had about a little less than a thousand people that came out. So, you know, every part of the, the church was, was filled. We hardly remember what that's like before COVID obviously, but um, it was standing room only, sitting room only, and it poured out into the streets as well. So we were very worried that somebody was going to call the fire chief. Uh, but when I looked out into the congregation, the fire chief and the police chief were also a part of the, the audience that night. So I felt like uh, we had a little bit of leeway. Uh, what really helped me to understand the possibilities for building um, beloved community in Evanston occurred that night. And that is when um, we specifically asked about 10 clergy persons to, to speak. And when we had um, the Iman of a local mosque um, to speak and to condemn the shooting and to stand um, alongside the LGBTQ community. I thought that was a riveting and important moment um, be, because generally speaking, that does not, um, that does not happen um, at the international level or at the national level. So we had white and black, we had multiple denominations and multiple faiths, including Islam, um, a, a Judaism and, and Christianity, both Protestant and, and Catholic. Um, it helped us to um, create a synergy in the religious leadership in the community um, that continues um, even these many years later. Uh, we have worked together on every kind of social justice issue that you can imagine um, and, and, and issues that many people would think are not necessarily social justice. A couple of years ago, Dr. Wolf and I um, were at City Hall and we were supporting um, a, a cease, um, a sort of program or an initiative to, uh, to, for nuclear disarmament. I guess that's what it, that's what, what it really was. And I was very involved in that when I was a younger pastor in Princeton many years ago, uh, there was a national office in the town, but, uh, I think Dr. Wolf called me and asked me if I would uh, participate in that effort. And, uh, and, and we surely did. So we've been involved in that. We were involved in an Asian American rally a little uh, over a year ago uh, when there was a lot of negative media that was being directed toward the Asian American community as well as, as violent acts throughout the country. And uh, we continue to uh, be engaged in those kinds of activities. Um, in 2020, uh, shortly after uh, George Floyd was killed, there was a major rally that occurred in Evanston, over 7,000 people were marching uh, through the streets of Evanston, and it was led by a group of high school students from Evanston Township High School, and uh, the religious community was very supportive. We were in the background, but we were there and also very supportive. So when you talk about what are the elements that make up a beloved community, there are two or three things that come to mind. One of them is, um, however well planned you may want to create this effort, I think that there has to be an almost organic development um, along the lines of people of goodwill gathering together. Um, and, and I think that when you plan it and when you decide you're gonna dot every I and cross every T, something always goes wrong. We all know that when, when in professional ministry, but when the kind of um, evolvement is organic, people are being led with uh, passion and being led with a, a sense of a combination of passion and logic together. And I think that's what, uh, that's what materialized. Now, I wanna say that, um, 
that what happened with the Evanston community and especially the interfaith community when reparations began is I believe that we were already able to create an atmosphere where people were listening to each other, different groups and different sectors of the community, public and private, black, white, Latinx, Asian American, you, you name it, um, Belize, uh, Jamaican, uh, West Indian, all of these groups are a part of the Evanston community. And they had been a part of these community laments. So when Robin Rue Simmons in January of 2019 introduced legislation at the um, city council about uh, reparations, uh, it wasn't a community that instantly rebelled and said, well, you know, we don't have anything to do with that. We you know, as many um, white people will say, you know, we were not slave owners or even my parents, my grandparents, we weren't slave owners. So it was an educational moment. And reparations is not just about making repair to the damage that was done uh, with 240 years of slavery, but it's about making repair to the damage that continues to be done as a result of a form of discrimination known as racism. And so um, the religious community really did, um, from the very beginning, support the reparations initiative that eventually turned into Resolution 126 that was passed by the city council in November of 2019. And um, the, the religious community has become more and more focused on reparations. Just this past Sunday, First United Methodist Church, led by Pastor Grace Amathu, um, presented a check to Saul Anderson, who is the executive director of the Evanston Community Foundation for $50,000 for the reparations initiative that has begun with a nonprofit organization called Reparation Stakeholders Authority of Evanston. And so um, we have other major religious um, houses of worship that are doing the same. Uh, uh, Lake Street, uh, you're going to hear, I'm sure, from uh, Dr. Wolf about some of the work they're doing in reparations. Beth Emmett, uh, the Free Synagogue, has been working to make that happen. Uh, the Unitarian Church of Evanston has been working to make that happen. And there are pledges that are coming in from um, so many of the major houses of worship to work toward finding financial uh, monetary ways to repair damage of racism that has been done to Black families in Evanston um, since the early 1900s. To me, that is not just talking about um, beloved community, but it is joining together to find ways to repair damage and to actually build um, beloved community. I believe that the reparations movement, again, was ripe for being introduced to Evanston because of the work that was being done by the interfaith community and houses of worship in the years prior. And we don't claim complete credit for that. That work was being done when I was a pastor over in Detroit and when I was a pastor in Princeton 30 years ago. So it's a work that continues with each generation. And Dr. Wolf and I are proud to be a part of a current generation um, that is helping to make that happen. So um, I've said this before, and, and I think I'll say it again and conclude with this. Of all of the communities that I've lived in, I believe that Evanston has all of the important benchmarks for the creation of what is truly a beloved community. It's not a perfect community, but a community where every single resident and every single individual and family has the same equal rights and the same opportunities for equity in every sector of their lives. That's what that's what beloved community is all about. So I'm going to stop there, I think, and then turn it over to Dr. Wolf and ask uh, him to continue. And then I guess we'll Q and A after that. Sure. Uh, so I think uh, thank you for that, Dr. Neighbors. Uh, it's exciting times in Evanston as some of the first um, reparations payments have been made to those families of that first four hundred thousand. But the total is ten million dollars. Um, and I just want to say that uh, for faith communities and thinking about this, uh, the city's le legislation, the city's reparations initiative, is. Uh, 
a real conversation starter for thinking uh, about reparations in broad and capacious ways within faith communities. And so faith communities have really picked this up. Uh, not And uh, there's a big fundraising effort where we're coordinating uh, what could, would it be like to raise money um, as a faith community together that's coming together as we're trying to figure out not just each congregation is sort of saying, here's the fundraising goal, but what does it mean to come together and say, this is important for faith communities in Evanston. Uh, but there's also a, a bunch of different ways to think of, about reparations, not just sort of on the monetary, monetary sort of sense. Uh, we're, we're also thinking about what, what are these legacies of white supremacy and racism that form and a real part and parcel with our congregational life and how do we work through that? And so uh, Dr. Neighbors and I um, put together sort of an interfaith um, panel that was about reparations that was thinking about, okay, so there's biblical models for repair and we can go through and we can read something like the Exodus story. And we can see if you're reading the Exodus story, it's sort of plain right there when you're looking for it, but uh, so often we're not looking for it or some people are not looking for it. That That's a story about reparations, that uh, as the Israelites leave, uh, they, they are given reparations um, upon their freedom and uh you know tried to the egyptians were not so keen on that freedom but uh, they did receive reparations uh, to start uh, their new journey so uh, we can look through that we can look at the story of zacchaeus and see well what does it look like to have accountability uh, and to repay and we can look at those and we can look at all sorts of different things throughout scripture to see that grace and accountability really go together that they're not sort of a conversation that's separate from one another that we can really think about that but that's all sort of bound up in in christian language which is great you know i'm christian i'm a pastor my entire life is based on uh trying to make sense of uh these these texts that are in our bible and and what do they say to us and how can we think through that so i really value the biblical perspective but there's some ways that our national, in some ways our city, in some ways our, just our imaginations have to be broadened. Uh, when we're thinking about broadening our imaginations, when we brought together that interfaith panel, we wanna see what are the resources in other religious traditions that can teach us how to think about the work of repair that's not just from a Christian perspective, that's not just loaded um, up with all these ideas that are sort of pre-baked in, but what are we thinking, how can we think more expansively about the work of repair? How can we think more expansively about what it means uh, to, to practice reparations as a spiritual discipline, as a spiritual practice, not just something that we're talking about uh, passing legislation or um, you know writing checks, and that's all really important, but what does it mean to really take it on as a spiritual discipline that's part of the work of people of faith? And so I think folks have really done that. The Unitarian Church in conjunction with about four other churches in town had a, had a very um, important sort of set of workshops about what, what is redlining in Evanston. I mean, the first initiative of our reparations is, uh, is in the city from is a, about redlining and housing discrimination from 1919 to uh, 1969. And, it, and it's focused on that. I mean, there are other parts that are going to come online on how we're going to address the reparations, but that's the, that's the first sort of uh, focus. So it's important to understand redlining. And I just want to say, you know, that's important for places like me, this church behind me. That's, that's my church, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's cool, it's whatever. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I love that church. Um, but also, when you have a building and you have a place in a redlined community, that does mean in some ways that your building and your place is caught up and bound up in complex ways with redlining and with white supremacy. Uh, it means that we're here where we are, um, not by accident and that God didn't take our building and just sort of plop it down. Uh, what happened was that uh, we we have this building and we have it where it is on a, you know, a pretty city green uh, for a reason and for historical reasons. And some of those are bound up with white supremacy and some of those are bound up with discrimination. Some of those are bound up with redlining. And so for the first time, beginning to sort of name that like, well, why are these churches here and why were, and why are those churches there is an important conversation. And it's spatial. Uh, I, that's what I want to say is it's so embodied. We're in a city together and we live together and uh, we have to think through these sorts of issues. And that's complex and that's hard. It brings up a lot of emotions uh, for some folks, but I think it's, it's really important work in how we're thinking about that. So they went through redlining. They went through what was the 
what was particularly for white faith communities, what was the response? Um, a lot of times it, it, was, it was silence uh, for, for these redlining initiatives. I mean, with some, um, you know, some support in some places. I don't want to say that like people are evil or bad. That's not what this is about. But it's saying that, um, you know, when white churches were silent, they also reaped the benefits of that, um, that sort of silence, that they, uh, the status quo benefited them. And so how we talk about that really matters. Uh, and I think we are having those conversations in Evanston. And uh, one of the places that we're having those conversations is at, at Lake Street Church of Evanston, right? So, I mean, uh, we have a longstanding sister church relationship with Second Baptist Church. We were both one church, um, First Baptist Church way back in the day. Um, and uh, we are exploring all the positives of that. It's been a really mutually supportive relationship. And since 1991, we've been uh, sister, sister churches. And uh, that's been uh, our pastors have often had good relationships. This is not the first duo that is formed between our, our church's pastors. And that's, that's good. We honor that. I think that that's really important to name the ways that we have been in mutual relationship uh, for a long period of time. But there's also real complexities in that relationship that have to be named, too, and that are difficult to name. Uh, so in 1882, uh, we were all part of First Baptist, but 10 uh, black members of First Baptist asked for layers of dismissal, which is the technical term. It doesn't mean that they were dismissed, but they asked for layers of dismissal in our tradition. But um, they did that to form free and independent black institutions uh, like Second Baptist, which is really important and uh, beautiful to name. And we want to celebrate that struggle. But they also left because uh, they were discriminated against. Uh, they had you see this balcony back here. Um, this is where um, the black members of First Baptist had to sit. It was in the balcony. So whenever I preach, and I am looking at the balcony, I'm thinking about that wound that's at the center of things. And so uh, it, we have to name some of those. Uh, we have to name uh, what it means to, to wrestle with uh, historical uh, and dif difficult wounds and stuff like that. I mean, even when we were uh, good, there's a dissertation out uh, at that um, we were, used to be First Baptist and we changed the name to Lake Street, but there's a dissertation out about white paternalism that caused a split with Second Baptist in Mount Zion uh, based on how close do you want to be to this white institution. So even when, you know, we are First Baptist and Lake Street churches um, being supportive, we're being supportive in ways that are uh, bound up with white paternalism. So how do we how do we name that? And how do we say there's something there's something in our future that uh, about naming that and about uh, making rep repairing that wound. And so now we're in conversations. I, I mean, we can't we don't know uh, where that's going to go uh, because both of our churches are sort of in discernment about what uh, practicing reparations with each other looks like. But, you know, I've named as something uh, that we're we're thinking about is restoring um, Second Baptist to ownership of the building uh, and sharing that ownership and and collaborating in rich ways and really building on that partnership. That's something that I've named and that we're, you know, discerning and thinking about how can we come together? How can we name that wound? But also, how can our building be a source for racial reconciliation? This is a real asset uh, to be able to have a bound up history that's complex, to be able to tell that story. And we have, um, and I want to say, especially for churches that are low on resources, right? Well, your building is a resource. How does the place that you inhabit become a site of ra racial reconciliation? How can it be? And these are the questions we want to ask. Dr. Neighbors, you wrote this beautiful article, or not, you gave an interview in, that came in this beautiful article in the Journal of Philanthropy that I really like, that um, Evanston is, in some ways, because of the close relationships that people have. It's not a giant place. You know, we, we do know each other in some concrete ways that, that we were uniquely sort of positioned to form these relationships, form beloved community and practice reparations. The game changer here for me is uh, what if we started to think about churches as uniquely positioned to practice reparations? After all, we don't exist just sort of on a one, one lifespan. They exist on and on. Uh, they have a, a richer lifespan. Uh, we're, we're still in existence and Second Baptist is still in existence. So it means that there's a relationship of accountability that can happen there that exists beyond the scope of like 50 or 60 years. It really exists into um, the present. And so what if we thought about ourselves as moral institutions with places, with resources as uniquely positioned to do this work. I think that's a game changer for me. I think it's a game changer for Lake Street Church as we're, you know, um, I think it's a, it's really, it's, it's really something that uh, I think we feel called to. And I think that, um, you know, as we work out that sister church relationship and think, think about that, how do we think about churches as uniquely positioned to practice reparations and as sites 
of racial reconciliation. I want to uh, let Dr. Neighbors uh, talk a little bit after that. So, okay. uh, Dr. Wolf, thanks. I, I want to make sure that um, I want to make sure that the audience heard clearly and and recognize very clearly what the offer was uh, from Dr. Wolf and Lake Street that came just a couple of weeks ago and became public because it really is, I think it's the buzz of the town now. <laughs> Initially it was the buzz of the of our congregations, mm -hmm. um, but now it seems to be the buzz of the town because folks have heard about it. So so Dr. Wolf and, and, and Lake Street um, shared a wonderful letter. And in that letter, um, they offered Second Baptist the reality of 50% of the building. They, they said, this is, this, is, this is your building as much as it is ours. And that, and that, and, and you all, I want you to know that that's heavy. I'm not sure there's ever been an offer like that um, <laughs> in the history of Christendom, <laughs> you know, let alone right, right here in our area. And, and, and what that means, it's not just, you know, okay, we'll take, um, We'll, we'll take 50% ownership of the building. It doesn't mean that at all. There's a, there's a spiritual element that is involved. There is, um, there is a sacred element, uh, element that's involved in terms of what, what this is all about. What does it mean to build community? What, is this, that, what does this actually mean? And, and, and so I think it's important for you to know that most of the time when a white church offers its building to a black church, it is either sold or the white church is usually going out of business that they don't have any members anymore. There's a classic <laughs> illustration of that happening right now in Atlanta. Uh, when this, when this um, offer came at the very same time, two churches in Atlanta um, had a similar situation, both of them United Methodist. Grace United Methodist Church, one of the oldest Methodist churches in Atlanta, only has a handful of members left. They're a white church. They just spent $6 million on renovations of their building about five years ago. There's another United Methodist Church called Cascade, which is a black church, which is a mega church with about six or 7,000 members. They came together and Grace uh, recognized that um, they, they needed to, to offer their building to this much larger church. So they're, they're trying to figure out what that means and how it's going to work out. But that's because one church is on its sort of last leg and another church is this burgeoning church. Well, with um, Lake Street and Second Baptist, it's different. Both churches are, are doing very well with burgeoning and robust ministries and, and memberships as well. So that that makes it a little bit different. So I wanted you to get that and to understand that we are working our way through that reality right now. It is not like Second Baptist is just uh, going to respond and say, oh, okay, that's great. We'll take you know um, ownership of half of your building. It is so much deeper than that because we have a pre-existing relationship and because of the fact that we um, have uh, relationships between our congregations. We have families that know each other, individuals that know each other and have known each other for decades as well. So I just wanted to share that. But I, I think I'll stop now and throw it back to uh, Dr. Wolf and maybe we'll open up uh, soon for Q&A. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I think what I would like to say is just like, it's hard work. Uh, you know, like, I mean, it's hard work for Second Baptist and it's hard work for Lake Street to figure out what what would it mean um, to to come together in a, a more profound way? What, what would that look like? That's, that's hard work. We're working our way through it. I think we're, you know, going to do something, but I think that you can't, we don't know what the shape, you know, we can't tell you what the contour of it is going to be, but it's going to be, uh, I think, something that's powerful that can advance conversations within our churches and hopefully elsewhere about what it means uh, to be accountable to one another, to love one another, and to to really uh, practice that reparations as a spiritual discipline. So, Reverend, Reverend uh, Pastor Wolf and Pastor Neighbors, um, we are first grateful for these stories uh, that we're hearing right now um, about work that's happening that a lot of people don't know about um, and grateful that folks are beginning to pick this up a little bit more. Uh, what, what I'm doing for other folks who are watching now is giving you a chance to get your question ready. So uh, there's something that you are hearing inside of you because of what you've heard uh, from these two gentlemen. There's something that uh, you're questioning or wondering about. 
Uh, there's something that you need to hear a little bit more about. You have question marks over there somewhere. So I want you to begin finding those. One of the, the things that I think is really important uh, though to respond to maybe perhaps is that I am, uh, I don't even wanna say impressed. I'm excited that uh, you all starting point is theology. There are so many ways in which the reparations conversation begins from a secular place, right? Like in most contexts, when you hear people talking about reparations, um, it's happening right now in the community where McCormick's campus is and Hyde Park students at the University of Chicago have, have been ha having this rally cry on and off, you know, at different temperatures for years, for decades. Um, and you, you described it, Pastor Neighbors, in, in Princeton, you know, 30 years ago and other kinds of spaces, right? It's been mostly a secular conversation, uh, which is not to demean it, you know, but simply to say that the primary source has been uh, talking about policies, uh, legal procedures, and ways in which we would go about that and talking about it primarily from a perspective of justice. Um, and that you, uh, Pastor Wolf, are really starting us from a place of theology and starting this conversation from a place of what it means to be faithful in the world. Um, and so I just wanted to name that uh, and how, how uh, remarkable it is for you to be like surprised that other folks aren't doing that. Like, you're like, of course we're starting here, you know, but that's the place to start. And it, and it really does raise a, a difficult uh, question or a question that perhaps everyone in seminary or having gone through it now has before us. Like, what, what does it mean for us to truly live out our theology? What does it mean to begin with our theology um, and then begin to form institutions based on how we understand ourselves and God and neighbor and, you know, these kind of words that end up in papers, but, you know, now, now has to be alive every Sunday for you all, you know, as you're looking up at the balcony, theology is being embodied in a very different kind of way. And so just wanted to name that uh, for all of us. And if there are questions from others, whether it be on Facebook or or on our Zoom, uh, well, we have doc, time. Dr. De, Dr. Deshaies here. Let me let me get back at that because I, I appreciate that insight and that perspective. And let me let me say very quickly, it's very interesting that the talk of reparations has been has been political. It 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 has been. Uh, it's been outside the context of the church. But but keep in mind that that's how that conversation first began. So the real the real talk about reparations came hundreds of years ago, but you know we we know it as uh, General Sherman of the Union troops um, offering forty acres and a mule uh, to newly freed black men. So it even went beyond that. But I, I think that even in Evanston, the actual reparations movement did begin politically. It did begin with Robin um, Simmons, the older woman that introduced. Um, the reparations piece that was passed by city council in 2019. But I think that what has happened is that the, the, the religious community in, in, in Evanston caught that and we were not offended that it actually began, but we just sort of said, you know, that's a good idea. And we need to wrap that now around our belief system. We need to wrap that around our theology. We need to wrap that around our understanding of God at work in human history at this point and, and at this time. So I think that might be a lesson for the church. I'll leave that to you academics to make that decision, but that every now and then there can be something that comes out of the context of the secular world that is a motivator for those of us who are in our respective churches to then wrap that moment or that initiative around our belief system and our and, and, and again, our understanding of God. So I appreciate the way you brought that up. No, absolutely. And, and I've just, uh, for folks who are in the Zoom, posted two articles that uh, when you leave this space, you'll be able to continue, you know, or even share this story with others and see a bit more. 
uh, past the neighbors, I don't want you to think you're not being academic here. Y'all are, y'all are dropping it on us right now. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I want that, that uh, line to be so thick between us. Right? I think we are, we, are, uh, we are sharing this space together and uh, the work that you all are doing. It, what you just said though does, and, and the Sojourners article I posted, and, and if it's not in Facebook, we'll get it in Facebook as well. But uh, it raises for me uh, what conversation partners theologically you all have had, what, uh, like, who's, who's a part of this conversation coming along with you, either historically or today? I, I, I think I saw Bonhoeffer, I think I saw Kelly Brown Douglas and other, a few other folks, but uh, it's not right in front of me right now. But um, yeah, who, who are some of the, the conversation partners you all are using right now? So um, from, from my vantage point, um, I'm a, a real student of history. And so I would call upon um, those sages and ancestors that went before us, um, that engaged in um, a dialogue about reparations and race relations and what that means from a theological and from a, a faith perspective. You know, at the national level, you all probably know that uh, John uh, Conyers, the Congressman from Detroit, was the one that pinned the original HR 40 uh, over 30 years ago, which is a reparations movement that's been stuck in the house for 30 years. But Sheila Jackson Lee is bringing it back to life now from, from, from Texas. But, but John Conyers was a man of faith over in Detroit. And his pastor um, was none other than uh, Dr. Charles Adams. And Dr. Charles Adams is, has been a major voice uh, in, in, in African-American uh, religion and, and religion in general. A, a, a Harvard man, uh, Dr. Wolf, unfortunately, he didn't go to Princeton, but he went to he went to Harvard, and uh, and it voted very well for him. And and he has been a major influence and was a major influence with uh, with with John Conyers as well. So dialogue with um, with Dr. Adams and many of his ideas and thoughts about race relations and reparations has has proven to be pivotal and wonderful, and especially the body of work um, that he that he has worked with. But another major person that is uh, that you may be interested in because she's right down near you um, is Dr. Iva Carruthers, and and Dr. Carruthers, um, who is the uh, chair of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference has been a part of the discussion in Evanston reparations from the very beginning. So she brings to um, the table not only her uh, brilliant analysis and insight as a, as a thinker out of the African-American religious tradition, but the whole board and folks like Freddie Haynes from, uh, from uh, Texas and, and, and other folks from all around the country, um, they have been intensely observant and participating in the role of what we're doing here in the Evanston uh, community as well. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention those folk that uh, Dr. Wolf has already mentioned. Um, Eileen Wiviat is the pastor of the Unitarian Church of Evanston. Rabbi Andrea London is the rabbi of uh, Beth Emmett, the Free Synagogue. And uh, uh, Grace Mathu is the pastor of First United Methodist Church. Um, critical thinkers, brilliant in their own traditions, and they've been very hopeful for this conversation. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think that that's all great. I mean, I, I wonder if we can't also just think about some more, less sort of books and more sort of homegrown theology. Um, I think that, you know, demands for reparations from denominations are, are not exactly new. Um, obviously, a lot of denominations uh, created some sort of boards in the 60s to respond to demands of uh, reparations. Um, but the, that dream sort of went unrealized in some major ways, especially like in the American Baptist churches, which is, you know, my primary tradition. So thinking about that, I think about people at Lake Street um, who were part of Church Women United, who are part of these sort of grassroots sort of efforts uh, that we're trying to live out what it means to, to um, have a uh, peace at the time uh, and sort of racial reconciliation be a core part of what they what they were about and what they're doing and how to, how to live uh, that life and uh, i think that uh, all those sorts of resources uh, come back sometimes dreams unfulfilled 
So what do we do with wounds and what do we do with dreams that are that are sort of unfulfilled, that are launched a, a century before, but that haven't come to fruition, but have been named? Um, and I think that there are a lot of people who not who aren't necessarily even um, uh, major theological thinkers. I'm thinking about all, all the sort of uh, vision casting, those dreams, those demands uh, that were made uh, that have gone unfulfilled. Um, and a lot of those are uh, some of my uh, theological conversation partners. Yeah, Quite a bit. And, and and Dr. Wolf, let me add very quickly that um, the the Episcopal Church of the Northeast, um, I can't remember what um, state it was, but they issued a tremendous apology a few years ago when it was brought to their attention that the Episcopal Church was very much involved in the making of slave ships during the institution yeah. of slavery. And the apology um, was followed by a commitment uh, of, of initiatives uh, around dollars uh, to try to assist and help along uh, the way of race relations and African-American communities in that area. Also, since we've been talking about reparations the last couple of years, another church in Baltimore, another Episcopal church, um, wrestled right. with the reality of reparations and came away with the decision that they would go into their own treasury and start a $500,000 initiative to assist black families in their zip code, whatever their, you know, that because they recognized that their church had fundamentally supported um, practices and processes that were debilitating black families in their own zip code. And while they may not have participated in those uh, practices, they were silent and quiet uh, while they were while it was going on. So these kinds of initiatives are going on around um, around the country as well, um, big and small. Um, Evanston hosted a reparations uh, symposium in December of last year, and uh, 25 different towns and cities from around the country sent their folks into. Uh, the three-day symposium to learn from Evanston and to go back to their communities and to try to start uh, reparations initiatives. Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, San Francisco, uh, California, Amherst, um, Boston, uh, Chicago, so many different places. So that was important as well. So uh, Dr. Lindstrom uh, wrote in the uh, uh, chat, how do we uh, continue ourselves um, to nurture ourselves with this work that is going on. So, you know, I'm in the Black Baptist Church, so I love singing. <laughs> I love worship. So so worship, uh, praise and worship is very a very important part of my own nurturing. But, um, you know, I went to seminary and learned about some cat named St. Ignatius of Loyola and his early morning uh, daily examiner. So I got into that as well. So I go through my own uh, ritual on an early morning basis. Um, our churches may be interesting for you all and your students. Um, when I got here, our church decided to start a, um, a, a prayer call. And I, carry, I brought that with me from Detroit. And so we decided that we would um, institute a daily prayer call from Monday through Friday at six o'clock in the morning. They didn't know how it would work, but Second Baptist has always had a history of being a you know really praying church. So we started that in, uh, I would say, May of 2015. And now from Monday to Friday, we average about 75 to 100 people who call in um, for about a five to seven minute prayer to start their day. Um, they didn't want it to just be somebody praying. So they came back and asked me if I would structure um, the topics for each day and also give out an outline of what that looks like with scriptural references and all of that. So I said in 2015, that's great, I'll do that. Little did I know that they want me to do that every six months now. So, you know, it's, <laughs> so Dr. Lindstrom, you know, it's a way of being nourished, but it's a way of also wearing yourself out because there is so much that, that, that needs to be done. But that kind of fellowship is wonderful. And I would recommend that for any, house of worship that may not be doing that on a regular basis. It, it's really been instructive and helpful for our congregation. Uh, for me, if you have the capacity to take a vacation, you should take a vacation. Um, and I just want to say that, right? Not everybody has the capacity, the way the pressures on uh, modern clergy are not such that um, everyone has the ability to take a vacation to be away for any period of time. And I understand that. Um, but I'm saying if you have it, um, it's really important to protect your call and to protect your capacity to do this work, it, to take a little bit of time away. 
I think it's very important. Uh, and it's been very important for me. I could imagine how uh, Sabbath would be even more critical when you all are starting from a place of like organic development, as you've said, of sort of being willing to listen and see, you know, kind of read the tea leaves once a week and just kind of see where we are. What do we need to do? Who needs to be here? Uh, who's not here? You know, like what, what kind of conversations we need to be having makes all the important if you're going to take that position that there also has to be time to listen, time to hear uh, and to read what is what is happening and, and to help whatever is happening organically grow more. I have a question uh, from one of our students here about how uh, when you think about the reparative praxis as a spiritual discipline, what is that? How does that change uh, sermons, Sunday school, Bible study? Does it does it mean you have to change your mission and vision statement now? I, I mean, you all have already said, OK, 50 percent of the church, you know, like what are there other moments throughout the church's life and practice uh, that you are understanding the work as reparative? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, I, so I think that like the most important thing to name for me personally is that what I do is because Jesus Christ radicalized me, you know, people. So for me, it's all about faith. Uh, for me, it's all about uh, being pushed to do something because of my faith. Um, I don't think that I, I would do some of this work because frankly, it's hard. Um, and it, it makes me tired sometimes, but, and you know, all these sorts of things, but I, I feel pushed uh, by my faith. And so we don't, you know, at Lake Street, we're not, we're not amending uh, documents, for instance, because I think they all flow out of that, uh, that sort of uh, spirit of courage that's named in sort of our, our founding documents that sort of uh, thinking about what this, uh, what this uh, legacy of Jesus Christ means um, and how it lays the seeds for contemplative action and all those sorts of things. That's all part and parcel of the, the practice of repair. As you can imagine, because we're in this sort of season of dreaming and discernment with one another, um, almost, almost, almost all the sort of uh, Sunday school Bible stuff, everybody's talking about it. Um, so it's, it is sort of like a, a, a total uh, reconversion of that. Uh, but, you know, preaching, uh, I think that everybody in Evanston, you can't be a leader of the real positive here about reparations being such a topic of conversations. You can't be a faith leader in Evanston and not address reparations. You know, that it, it pushes people into the pulpit who might not otherwise want to talk about that or might not feel called to talk about that, but it is the topic to talk about. You must do it. Uh, and so I think that's been really useful. Um, and so it's not a new topic. I mean, I think it's been, ever since I got to Lake Street, it's been a topic of conversation that's been important. And so that continues. Yeah, I want to I want to diddle that as well. For me, I don't think it's been a, a stretch or a, a need to change or uh, to adopt something new um, as we as we address this new issue and this new topic. Because I think that for me, as a sort of social justice preacher, um, it's it's been very much a part of my um, of of my faith journey. You know, from the very beginning. So um, one of the things you all know what seminary is supposed to do is help the uh, pastor to be balanced and to wear two hats. I think one is you hit, you wear your priestly hat and you address the issues that need to be taken care of in terms of your congregation from a spiritual perspective and, and you know, from the liturgy to the sacraments and all of that. But the other hat is the is the is the prophet hat the prophetic hat you know what do you what do you say and how do you address the issues that are circulating around the church that inevitably have an effect on the church so I, I'll, I'll give an example for how we changed very recently um second baptist and lake street have been doing joint um bible studies for the last few years um a Linton Bible study uh, uh, series and also an Advent Bible study series. So this year, as we prepared to um, uh, go forward to do the Linton Bible study series, we're gonna use one particular book by a dear friend. I went to school with Dr. Renita Weems, so I'm telling my age, but you know, I, we were gonna use one of Renita's older, um, older books um, because we, we were still dealing with the reality of COVID, you know, and the heaviness of, of the pandemic. But when, um, when Lake Street, issued this letter 
were. And we had this new reality. We decided that we would change the book for our Bible study this year. And we went from Renita Weems talking about um, how to handle stress and and, and pain and sorrow to Dominique uh, Gilliard's uh, subversive, subversive witness, <laughs> you know that. So that's going to be our that's going to be our Bible study focus for uh, this Lenten series, which talks about privilege and how do you not feel guilty when you're in a position um, of privilege, but how do you use it uh, in in a way, a positive way, uh, to be a subversive witness to use your privilege and your position to make your community better and to make it stronger. So for me, um, I think I'm preaching that all the time, just about every Sunday, um, be because Second Baptist, uh, although we are certainly proud to be an African-American congregation, we are probably a privileged African-American congregation as well. Uh, and so we are always talking about what does that look like with what God has given us? How can we use that so that we can help to change and make the community around us better? Looking to see if there are any more questions. One of the things that hopefully uh, folks watching now or later are understanding is that this work is coming out of a deep sense of faithfulness um, and a response to uh, what people are hearing from God and from the spirit and how their gifts can be brought to bear to respond to those calls. I don't see. Well, well doc, doctor, let me also say that this is important with a little spotlight. Let, let me share that what, what Dr. Wolf said. It, it is hard work, but it's not just hard work for white people at Lake Street. It's hard work for black people at Second Baptist, it, just in a different way. So for me, when this came, you know, a, a response from some people is, well, you know, that's too much work. Why do we have to do that? God is blessing us. You know, we, you know, we, we, you know, we're growing even in a pandemic. You know, our our numbers are growing, our budget is growing. Why do we have to add something else to our our, our plate? You know, this makes me uneasy. You know, A, B, and C. And my whole piece is, it, my whole response is, um, God is always up to something new. God is not just doing the same old, same old. And in, and, and in this moment, can you imagine if we find common ground that can lead us to higher ground and create something that simply has not been created before, especially starting with how we ended up parting in 1882. If there's something that can emerge out of this can you imagine how it would not only influence these eight square miles in Evanston, but it would influence all of Metro Chicago and the state of Illinois and potentially the entire United States when race relations is at an all time low in my lifetime, a black and white church decide we're gonna to come together and do something to address this issue and turn our town into a beloved community. That's my hope. That's what I live for. That's what wakes me up in the morning and gets me started. Yeah. And I will just, I'll just echo that. I mean, I think that that is exactly what the call is. You know, um, I think that there are long seasons in my ministry that have been devoted to things that don't exactly um, mesh with why I feel like I got into ministry. I have balanced budgets. I have raised money. I have revised the bylaws. I have done all that sort of stuff and spent my leadership capital to do it. And because it's important, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you it's not important. I'm just saying, I don't necessarily feel called to it. And so when something comes around to where you feel a hundred percent aligned with God's will for this moment, for you, not that you're not going to make mistakes. I make mistakes, but when you feel a hundred percent aligned with God's will, you're going to chase that. You're going to, you're going to want to seize that moment. And that's what we're doing. We're going to, we're going to seize that and we're going to chase that. And because I think that when we're discerning, we're hearing, you know, a call to do something, we're hearing that call, um, both of us, both places, and we got it. We got to chase where the grace is for sure. Yeah, yeah. To chase after God's will, when we feel it happening within us. Amen. There, 
we're getting gems dropped on us right now, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to find common ground that will call us to higher ground. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to y'all. We, we are listening and we're being fed uh, by you all and, uh, across this past hour. And just want to offer some appreciation from the McCormick community uh, for you all's witness. Uh, for you all uh, feeding us and for feeding the community of Evanston and, and building a beloved community over on that corner and that part of where it needs to happen. And so uh, we are grateful. We are grateful, grateful, grateful. Um, if folks who are watching this want to be in touch, um, they can be found fairly easily. Um, and, and if not, then you can reach out to our Office of Experiential Education and we're glad to help connect you um, so that you can be part of this work or part of the work of the Proctor Conference, which is connected with us and other folks who are doing some extraordinary work. So thank you so much, uh, Pastor Neighbors, Pastor Wolf. You all are uh, assets to the church and assets to McCormick. Thank you for joining today's event with McCormick. If you've enjoyed today's event and would like to see more events like this, please visit us at mccormick.edu slash support, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. Stay connected with us by following us on social media or subscribing to our weekly newsletter. See you next time.